Um, and I am delighted to be speaking today um, with our esteemed guests. So we have um, Professor Sridhar Ventataparam, who is the Associate Professor of Global Health and Philosophy at King's College. Um, and he's the Director of the Global Health Institute in uh, London. He's the author of uh, Health Justice, an Argument for the Capabilities Approach. And he's recently co-edited a volume entitled Vulnerable, Law, Policy, and Ethics of COVID-19. Um, we also have Yolanda Wilson, who is a 2019-2020 National Humanities Center Fellow and also an Encore Public Voices Fellow. She is currently an Associate Professor at Howard University. Her research is at the intersection of bioethics, social and political philosophy, race theory and feminist philosophy, and Professor Wilson is currently working on a manuscript entitled Black Death, Racial Justice, Priority Setting, and Care at the End of Life. So what we're going to be doing today is we're first going to have um, Professor Wilson and Professor Ventataparam speak, um, present their thoughts on this really difficult and salient topic. Um, and then afterwards, I am going to uh, ask a few framing questions to start off the discussion. If you notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A section. Please start asking questions throughout the panel and we're going to give a significant portion of um, discussion at the end of this hour so that we could get to some of your questions. Um, so uh, now I think we'll start with Professor Wilson. Hi, thank you so much everyone for, for having me. Thank you to the audience for um, coming today and attending our talk. And so I, I guess I wanna start I know, I know we're going to be getting into the, the health stuff and the health justice stuff, but I kind of want to start by thinking about how we're framing a lot of these conversations, um, because that's what, <laughs> interestingly, in the past 12 hours or so, has, has um, really stood out for me even more than, than usual. So over the past few months, I've been invited to, you know, to give these, to give talks or to send panels related to the pandemic, particularly as it relates to the disproportionate impact that the pandemic is having in the U.S. on Black communities and also Latinx and Native American communities in the U.S. And, you know, given that I work kind of, I work in bioethics and I work in philosophy of race, um, you know, I, I guess that's a natural fit for asking me to do these things because, you know, we're seeing disproportionate mortality, morbidity, job loss, and other economic harm, um, jobs in dangerous circumstances, um, I would also call economic harm, and also uh, challenges with schooling, right? And so that, that'll be the next, the next compass com conversation, challenges with schooling that depend on for instance, stable internet connections or parents who can stay at home, right? I mean, a lot of a lot is assumed in even the notion of keeping children at home to to school virtually, and uh, a lot of the kind of um, dis disadvantages disproportionately fall on again Black and Latinx and Native American communities. I think the the last numbers I saw were something like only twenty percent of Black communities. Uh, have folks who can stay home as a part of their work without losing wages or um yeah without losing wages so so i'm really interested in that and, and all of these issues are really important and i think they're probably going to come up in greater depth over the course of the hour at the same time right each of these events that i've you know thought through been invited to talked about written about um, and, and this one included, is usually introduced with some variation of how the pandemic has highlighted or shown a light on or brought attention to, or even in some instances led to the discovery of inequality in society or inequity in society or racism in society or lapses in medical care in society, right? And, and I've even used some of that language myself at times. So, right, this isn't a kind of finger wagging moment. I, you know, I've said the pandemic has brought to light for, for, for many um, what these inequities look like. But, but other times, and I think this is one of them, that language 
it kind of sticks in my craw a bit. And it sticks in my craw because I wonder precisely for whom these inequities need to be highlighted in the first place. Right, so a lot of a lot is assumed even in how we frame the conversation that we're going to have, right? So certainly not the hundreds of thousands of so-called essential workers who've kept most of the economy going during the pandemic, certainly not, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who are uninsured in this country, certainly not uh, the thousands of people who are underinsured in this country, right? I mean, these aren't people for whom we need to have a conversation about highlighting inequities, right? So the need to highlight inequities in the first place reflects an attitude, to me at least, at a certain level of, of not only not knowing how a lot of folks are living, what, you know, what is just the day-to-day -day reality for lots of people in the U.S., but at a certain point, and I think this is, this is where it gets sticky for me, the problem becomes a problem of not wanting to know what's happening, right? Many of our lives are as comfortable as they are because we don't spend a lot of time thinking about or asking questions about what has to happen to make them that way, right? And, and again, this isn't a kind of finger wagging, chastise the audience moment for me. I, I include myself in this moment, right? In this number, right? Um, many of us, aren't thinking deeply about what it means to order groceries or just go to Amazon and, and deliver the things that we need while we're staying at home. And so in important ways, in important ways, many of us are, by virtue of our daily choices, responsible for perpetuating the very inequities and injustice that the pandemic is now highlighting, or, or at least that we're claiming that we're highlighting in these, in these kinds of conversations. And so, and that's certainly the case when we think beyond the US onto the global stage, right? When we think about the labor that has to happen, um, the, the working conditions of those who are continuing to make goods in the midst of a global pandemic, and what kinds of access to healthcare that people have globally. And I know that my, my fellow panelists will probably talk a lot more about, will talk a lot more about this and certainly knows a lot more um, of the details than I do. But I, but I think it's important to just kind of, to bring out this framing. You know, even, even if we think in the US context, right, something as simple as hand washing, right, that, that is highlighted as an important um, behavior that people can engage in in order to minimize risk of contracting the virus, is taken for granted in many communities, but not all, right? I mean, we see that a, a lot of Native communities don't have access to clean water. We see Flint is going on day God knows what without access to, to clean water. And so these kind of fundamental um, things, again, the question of highlighting is, is, is on some level has to be, at least in my mind, a, a question of not wanting to know. And so, you know, implicit in the framing of these discussions is a, is a kind of innocence that, that, um, that we're embracing that can't be accidental. So, you know, I was reading some James Baldwin earlier, and, and, as, and as he writes in The Fire next time, it's the innocence that constitutes the crime. So, you know, if we're thinking about connecting what we can do from a health justice standpoint or from a, a kind of broader distributive justice standpoint, even the way that we talk about highlighting or bringing to light or bringing attention to um, has to has to reflect the fact that some of our not knowing and some of the ways that we're living are are intentional and are contributing to to the problem so one issue that i'm thinking about in my current book my book project black death which is on racial disparities and end of life care is trust right i have a whole chapter on kind of medical mistrust in the US health system. But for me, one challenge of trust in the US health system, healthcare system, has to be, or I guess healthcare systems is more, or more appropriate, has to be the innocence with which certain actors engage patients who've lived lives shaped by systemic injustice. Um, and the people who've lived through these experiences have sometimes, in various ways and, and for various reasons, been dismissed as hysterical, as desiring handouts, as lazy, as, you know, drug seeking, you name it, depending on the illness and the ailment and why they're showing up in, in healthcare systems. But now, 
inequities are being highlighted, right? And, and I think that there is certainly from the standpoint of folks who are living these experiences of injustice and inequality, a kind of wondering whether some of our conversations are conversations that are disingenuous or whether we are um, finally going to exhibit the political will to think in certain ways. And so, you know, when I, when I think from that lens, when I put that hat on, then I think, well, you know, of course, no wonder there's a certain level of mistrust in our healthcare institutions. So, so what does it mean that, you know, I'm just going to go on and put out there the elephant in the room. What does it mean that before the news broke that President Trump tested positive for COVID, that we learned that 19,000 Amazon workers tested positive for COVID, right? That was in the news a couple of days ago. And these same workers, right, these are the same workers who months ago revealed that their working conditions weren't safe. And these are the same workers who Amazon executives, I don't know if you can think back a few months to earlier in the summer, uh, were caught on tape strategizing how to discredit, right, on the grounds of things like articulateness, right? I, I know two or three months feels like a lifetime ago in, in pandemic time, but, but if you can just kind of remember, remember back that far. Um, that 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 was kind of a real conversation happening in the news, and so I know that this is this is a bioethics event, and we're supposed to be focusing on healthcare. And at the same time, right, I'm a social and political philosopher by training, and so I have to think about these kind of social contexts, these broader social contexts in which these issues are arising. And you know, my good UNC analytic philosophy training um, forces me to think about getting clarity about how we're even framing the problem. So for me, a lot of pre-work has to happen in order to even have the conversation that we're going to have today. But I, I just wanted to to kind of highlight these things and and maybe think through them a little bit more together. Because as I said, you know, again, I'm not finger wagging. I, I'm guilty of some of the the same behaviors, even as someone who is working class and has lots of family who are essential workers. Um, you, you know, just kind of thinking through what this conversation looks like in terms of making things better or in terms of how we contribute to making things better. So I'll stop right here. I think that's been about 10 minutes and um, I look forward to continued discussion. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have some questions for you, so I'm excited. All right, and um, so <laughs> uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Vinta Tapparam. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you somebody just wave? Okay, great. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilson, for that fantastic uh, first uh, high bar to set that you now sort of have to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you very much for this opportunity and for all of you that have made time to join us today. Uh, it's a particularly, uh, as I was saying to the other people on the panel today, it's a particularly important and special sort of talk is that I rarely get invited to speak to you know, people in the United States about health justice. Um, and I think a lot of you know why. Uh, in terms of why do we not, why are we not interested in health justice until a pandemic comes? Um, and so now people are interested in this concept. Um, so I want to just say, you know, this is a really, uh, you know, sort of important one and I value it greatly. So in the, in the moments, in the minutes that I have, I'd like to just um, do three points. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember these three things. One is that this pandemic is a socially created pandemic. It's not an act of God. It's not an act of nature. It's something that we have created globally and locally, and there are ethical implications of that. The second thing is that I want you to think about health as being a freedom, not about health care. I want you to think about health as the ability to be as healthy rather than just getting access to health care. And then the third part is that I want you to think about the injustice of a society that does not provide conditions for people to be healthy. Uh, and those are the three things, and I'd like to just walk you with you through those three things. So the first part is that, you know, health in general, and I, we have been told in America that health is all a personal issue. It's about what you do. 
It's about whether what you eat, what you drink, what you smoke, whether you exercise, it's all you. And it's not, it's blatantly not true. The idea is that health profoundly is determined by the social surrounding environment from the local to the global. If the air that you are breathing is toxic, then you are going to be healthy. If you don't have uh, clean food that's available, accessible and cheap for you to eat, then you're going to eat what's available and cheap and that may not be the healthiest food for you. If you don't have parks that you can walk in, if you don't feel safe outside, then you're not gonna go running and jogging. If you can't afford a gym membership, you're not going to be able to do it. So the external social, economic, and political condition have a profound influence on your health beyond your individual choices. What choices you have depends, what choices you make depends on the choices that you have. And these choices are not equal and they're not uh, sort of generous for many people. And they're reflected in the health inequalities that we see in America today. But what does this mean about a socially created pandemic? Is that we knew that social determinants of health existed before the pandemic. But right now, what's become clear is that the virus emerged in a village or a city or a market in China because of the policies that were allowed to happen or neglected. The animal-human interface was something that people have been watching and warning about for years now, and it was expected. This was not an unexpected pandemic, and the ones coming are not going to be unexpected. We know they're coming. But think about the rules that shape whether people could uh, transmit it to others and how uh, the quarantines and whether they were effective or not. Think about the flight paths from which uh, the, trans uh, the virus moved from the most major metropolises from Wuhan, China to all the global ones. These are all social choices that we made and we allowed to happen. And also think about the policies in all the different countries that were implemented and how this is reflected in the levels and distribution of the infections in the population. These are not natural events. These are not God events. These are social policies that we either chose to implement or neglect. And so as a result of that, who is getting sick and who is dying is because of the choices that we have made and or the choices that we have not made. And as a result, this is a matter of justice. It's not a matter of luck. It's not a matter of personal behavior. This is a matter of our social justice and the kind of choices that we've made. And we need to think very hard about that. The reason that I start with that is that in the beginning of this pandemic, the role of ethics has been so narrow it's been astounding to me that as the infections were spreading across the world and as they were spreading within countries, the first people that people, when the journalists and people were saying, well, what is the ethics here, right? The first thing they reached for is, oh, ventilators. We need to think about how we distribute ventilators. And my question is, wait a minute, aren't you worried about who is getting sick and why we should not be thinking about the causes of those transmissions and how to protect the vulnerable. And so the fact that most people really think of ethics in relation to health only in terms of bioethics, in terms of those medical questions, in terms of the distribution of rare commodities or technologies is I think a real uh, indication of where we are when we think about health and ethics in America today. And even as time goes on, we have not been thinking about, uh, as philosophers, people are worried, like, how do we make sense of this, right? Meanwhile, people took to the streets because they recognized, hey, the problem of justice is not ventilators, it's the causes of these deaths and disabilities. And the fact that someone is murdered on camera shows you that this is happening in different ways. So it's the streets, it's the riots, it's the social movements that are actually asking academics, philosophers to say, put health into your questions about political philosophy and social justice, and put health into your questions about global health ethics and global health justice. And I think this is one of the most important things that I can leave you with is that philosophers and bioethicists are not prepared for these issues. And I've been surprised that 
people seem to struggle with these questions and it's not. We've been talking about this since the AIDS epidemic that, hey, it's actually social inequalities and social injustice and death from epidemics are related. The kind of society that you have is reflected in the deaths that you see in epidemics and the health inequalities that you have. So the second thing that I would like to um, sort of leave you with is this idea that in America, we've become so obsessed that the issue is healthcare because not everyone has access to healthcare or it's so expensive or it's not enough. But the actual issue is that healthcare is only one cornerstone of people's ability to be healthy over a life course. It's that we want to be able to ensure that every human being that is in the United States is able to live a long, healthy life. And that is not just because they have a hospital down the road or they have a doctor that they can see when they're sick. It's about the ability, the conditions that they are living in inside the household, the conditions of their neighborhoods and the conditions in their cities and the political system and the economic system that determines their abilities to be healthy. And one of the most profound things that this pandemic has taught everybody in the world is that your health is no longer or has never been local. What happens around the world in faraway places will come and impact you. It's always been impacting the poor of the world for a long time. But now the rich of the world and even the poor and rich countries now recognize that their health is related to what's happening on the other side of the world. So the concept I really think that we should be focusing on is this ability or capability to be healthy, not just healthcare. And the last, I guess, the, the third and final thing is that we really need to be thinking about justice and this idea of every individual's right to be healthy, not just everybody's right to getting healthcare when they're sick. And if we can start focusing on that, I think we'll be able to see the absolute deprivations in this country, we'll be able to see who's actually the worst off, who's the one that's most constrained in their ability to be healthy, and what are the kinds of interventions and programs that we design, what is the kind of collective action that we need to take in order to ensure that the worst off in terms of their abilities to be healthy can be transformed so that we can protect them and have them live their lives. So there's much to be talked about, there's much to be said, but those are the three things that I really wanted to get out there into this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so there's already a few questions in the Q&A. Please feel free to start asking questions. And I'm gonna throw some questions out in the next um, 20 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll go to audience questions. So the first question um, is related to, um, is well, so maybe I'll start with the first question that I was thinking about is actually, what do the lessons of COVID-19 tell us about the future of work, right? And it seems like both of you have touched upon how uh, uh, thinking about justice in a more comprehensive way makes us um, a little bit more attentive or pushes us to be more attentive to the ways in which our environment and our working conditions also have an impact on our health. And so I'm wondering if there are any sort of lessons and any sort of um, reforms that you think could, uh, could, could be implemented to ensure um, that the most vulnerable in our society are protected. Professor Wilson, do you want to go first or do you want to time to think? What would you like? I went first last, so I'll let you go first this time. And uh, okay. yeah. So I think there is, um, so I'm gonna uh, try to give a quick answer. One is that um, everybody needs to work. Uh, rare are the group of people that can survive and live without working. Um, and they're either because they can't work or because they don't have to work. And I think that the majority of people find work because they need to survive to make their payments, but also work is meaningful to human beings' lives. And I don't want to, and let's not forget both of these things, is that people who don't have work, you know, lose a sense of meaning in place. 
So in the United States, we have supposedly, we're supposed to have great protections for workers' health. Uh, and this is one of the fundamental things is that work is supposed to be safe for us in order to be able to do the work that we need to do. And unfortunately, in lots and lots of different sectors, those conditions have been erased to the point where so many workers now are just basically responsible for their own environment. They're just basically uh, sort of, you know, consultants or um, gig economy, et cetera. And so they're basically responsible for not only working, but all the conditions in which they work. And that's their problem, essentially. They're being given opportunities to earn money and then that's the only thing that's tough. So I think that this is, these are all these different kinds of individuals and we need to recognize everybody needs to be able to work safely. Um, that the, from an ethical perspective, that's how I would come at it saying, work is important for survival and for meaning. And therefore we need to be able to make it safe for people in order to be able to work. I think that it is um, one of the, the greatest uh, injustices to make people choose between surviving because they have to work and earn versus uh, taking the risk of, of, of death or of morbidity as a result. That is not a choice that we should um, encourage or to be able to you know, force people to do. And the United States seems to be a great natural experiment where different states are taking different positions on that. And I think that this is one of the reasons that I talk about collective action is because it really is only through collective action that you can protect um, that ability of people to work and safely work. Sorry, go ahead. I'm done. Oh, okay. Um, so I know your question is about the future of work. I want to think a little bit about the history of work in, in this country and, and what and how it bears on a question about the future of work. I think that from its inception, uh, the U.S. was a place built on forced labor. And I think we have to be very clear about what that means in terms of how, how the nation views work or how the nation views the dispensability of certain workers. And so I think, um, you know, so, so when you think about even some labor protections like workman's comp, right? Um, domestic workers and farm workers are explicitly excluded from, from those kind of protections or from social security protections. And so, you know, there's always been this kind of tension um, between whose work is valued and which workers are valuable and how are they valuable under which circumstances. And I don't think that that ever fully went away. And so to, to ask the question about the future of work and how we ensure the health and safety of workers is going to require a kind of fundamental um, shift in understanding, right, the ethical question about are there some workers who are dispensable or disposable and, and what that means and also what that's going to mean on the consumer end in terms of convenience, in terms of cost of goods, right? I mean, you can't, I don't think you can disentangle those, those questions. And so just as in the 19th century, cotton is cheap, not accident, like it's not accidental that cotton becomes cheap, right? It's, it's a labor, it's a question of who's engaging the labor, right? In the 21st century and going forward, we have to think about what it means for goods to be cheap and what it means for some of us at least to be able to live lives of, of convenience. And I think the willingness to answer those kinds of questions and how we answer those questions is going to reflect our values as a larger society and including who's va what's valued and who, and who is valued. And so I think, you know, as my colleague talked about the gig economy and such, right? We have a gig economy, right? That's not accidental. That it's not just some people decided they wanted to use their personal cars to drive people around, right? I mean, we, we can't disentangle the, the social contexts from, from what's happening. And so I think there's gonna have to be a, a, a full reckoning about what's valuable, who's valuable and, and what those of us who benefit are willing to, to give up in order to 
ensure that everyone has access to, to safe, healthy work. Thank you. Um, so last week, JAMA com commentary um, had an argument that has for a long time been made, but I think it's really getting popular salience that it's racism, not race, that is driving health disparities um, in COVID-19. And um, uh, PNAS uh, also had this sort of, this paper about sort of how US racial inequality may be as deadly as COVID-19, right? So um, there would have to be in 2020, 700,000 excess white deaths in order to meet the highest mortality, the best mortality rate for um, Black Americans. And so I'm wondering how we should think about that, um, about racial disparities and um, institutional racism. And if this is at least a moment for us to really reckon with this distinction between race and racial inequality and institutional racism and what is really driving um, these health inequities in our society. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, th th this has just been an interesting moment for me as, as someone who, who thinks a lot about race um, and who thinks a lot about racism. And I do think on one level, philosophers in particular haven't been prepared for this moment. I also think you know, even how the discipline has formed itself and reproduced itself is a function of that, right? Because there have been a lot of philosophers who've been writing about these things, thinking about these things, talking about these things, who've been told for generations that they weren't doing philosophy, that they need to go somewhere else with it, you know, take that black shit somewhere else, right? Um, <laughs> our colleague at, our former colleague at NIH, Akila Jefferson, wrote a piece in Huffington Post a few months ago about um, her own family in New Orleans and her family experience with, with COVID and the numbers in the US that I think is something like one in four black people who know, know someone who's had COVID or who's died from COVID. And just the difference in what that looks like and what that means for this to be directly in one's face as opposed to just this kind of abstract thing that happens to people out there somewhere that maybe you care about, maybe you sort of don't care about. But I, and I think that that also reflects racism in this country, right? This, this, this way in which the lives of entire populations of people don't register for you in any kind of significant way, because they don't have to register for you in any significant kind of way, um, beyond being in maybe a service capacity or some kind of incidental engagements and interactions with one another. And so I think that, you know, I keep I keep hammering kind of the, the broader social context here, but I, but I think that that all becomes part of it. Who, who are the essential workers? It's not accidental. That's a function of institutional racism. Um, who, where people live, right? So we know neighborhoods in this country are largely segregated. And so you don't even see um, the people who become essential, who are essential workers. You don't see the people who are getting sick. You don't, you don't have these, opportunities and some of that is quite willful to not engage um, particularly black, black and Latinx people. And so certainly I think the, the, the insistence that this is, a, a is also a, a manifestation of racial inequality is quite apt. And I think if we're honest and serious about addressing COVID, we have to address racism too. And so I think it's important that you know, that you see this convergence of the pandemic and many of the protests that happened over the summer and in some places are, are ongoing. Thanks. Um, if I could uh, pick up on the JAMA piece, uh, and there's two things that I want to say in response to that. So from my understanding of the piece, it's, it's racism, not race, that is responsible for health inequalities. What the argument is, and everyone who's watching now should understand this, is that when you say race is the cause of health inequalities, you're saying that it's something about the biology of the individual. When you say racism is the cause, you're saying what's being done to these individuals is the cause of their poor health and health inequalities. And I can't I, I don't know how emphatically to say this, but like 
in 2020, finally, somebody is like, oh, it's racism that is killing people, right? So one of the things is that if you said this five years ago, one year ago, you would have been kicked out of the room because there's too much science involved in the race is the cause of health inequalities. There isn't enough science on the racism, right? And so I want you to think about this from an ethical perspective, not the, I don't want to go into the epidemiology of it. The worst thing that you can do to a human being is to kill them arbitrarily. We find this to be one of the most morally repugnant things to do because of a variety of different kinds of ethical beliefs and starting positions, whatever they might be. So now think about um, how racism kills people prematurely. This is, I think, one of the most worst moral uh, injustices of the United States today is that racism shortens lives and that is unjust. And it also, racism causes disease in individuals so that people are disabled and can't live good flourishing lives. That is unjust. People before thought, oh, it's really bad racism because people don't have economic opportunities. They're not getting the jobs. They're not getting the promotion, their stuff. You know, I totally am with you on that. I have studied at fancy schools and I've gone to, you know, schools with black Americans and I, you know, see them struggle trying to become bankers at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and I, I feel for them. That is not my primary worry in this country. The primary worry is that people die younger. People live disabled lives because of racism. The question about whether racism causes economic hardship and whether they're being stopped because of that is I think um, for me, you have to be alive before you can make money. And that's why it's more foundational to me. And I also don't want to be, you know, people making me choose, oh, do you want the economic opportunity or do you want the health? I think that's not the question. The problem is the racism, not which one is the, is the worst problem. Um, so I guess that would be how I would leave it that, and I'm, I can't tell you enough, something so obvious in the United States, right? Racism kills people prematurely and makes them suffer disease and disability in their lives. Why does it take so long in a pandemic to make that so obvious? So I, I just wanna say one more kind of quick, get a little quick point in. Um, for me, this wasn't a finally moment in the sense of, um, this being some great academic revelation, right? I mean, black scholars have been writing about this for over a hundred years. Du Bois is writing this in the souls of black folk in 1903, from, you know, making connections between social conditions and health and, and black lives. And so I think the kind of larger white academy is, is the kind of, is just the, the placeholder that I'll use to describe this. Don't forget the Brown Academy and the other academy. We're also there and we've also been at fault. I'm here because yeah. of that. So yeah, 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 so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, right. So this isn't a, a, wow, this came to the, no, no, no. Right. I mean, there have been folks who've been kicked out of the academy, not taken seriously, not being tenured, dismissed as just kind of fringe wacky people. Um, you know, so I just wanted to, I just want to clarify that. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I just, yeah, 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 no, absolutely. I mean, you're absolutely right. Is that this story that, you know, racism against black Americans, but I also want this opportunity to be like, you know, in the American conversation is absolutely necessary at, between the, at the deprivations and harm that are suffered by Black Americans. But I also want us to think about the Native Americans that are simply at the margins that have not even been recognized in this until, you know, stuff. So, but you're absolutely right. It's like, who exactly are we talking to? But on the other hand, I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, JAMA is talking about racism. Yeah, that JAMA picks it up is huge. Yeah, yeah. So that Right, and that, that kind of highlights the disconnect, right? That you have these folks working on the fringes and now JAMA does this, like Christopher, Christopher Columbus's racism and I'm like, wow, there's racism. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna ask one more question um, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. I see some people are already asking questions. Thank you very much. Please um, keep them coming. So um, both of you have thought about priority setting um, in the medical context and I mean, one question I guess I have is, what are resources or scarce resources that you wish bioethicists, political philosophers, 
and potentially policymakers thought more about that, you know, sort of these resources that we sh should really think about um, that should be a matter of justice um, that aren't discussed enough. I'm, I'm waiting for you to answer that, Professor Wilson. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I, I went no, first no. last time, so I, no, so no, I keep no. trying to like be mindful of. <laughs> no, no, no. Go, go for it. Uh, I should call I'm, I'm alternating so that we're not. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I do. I do think that we have to have a conversation. And I think you're right, right? That this isn't the primary conversation. This isn't an either or conversation. But I do think we have to have a conversation about wealth and inequity in this country. And what that looks like, because that can be the difference between, um, right, what whether you can take a day off if you don't feel well, or you know, whether you have access to clean water. So I so I do think you know just the the buffering effect that that wealth has I think has to be part of the conversation about health justice. Right, so, so, you know, you, again, I don't think this is the start or the finish. I don't think this is just about whether somebody can get a job at Goldman Sachs, but I do think, you know, um, so, so where I'm from in the country, and deep in the country, my mother gets so furious when I describe us as being from the country, but we are. You know, so my mother has a septic tank, right? And, there, and lots of people have se septic tanks out in the country, and, you know, those back up. But when they back up, if you don't have money to get that pumped out or, if, you know, get that taken care of, otherwise, you end up with, Lot, raw sewage in your yard is, is the nicest way to put that. And there are people who have failed septic tanks in this country who live with raw sewage in their yard, right? That, these are broader infrastructure problems on kind of a social level. So I think, yeah, when we think about social infrastructure, that has to be. And it's also a wealth, a wealth issue, right? Because it, having a septic tank pumped out isn't the most expensive thing in the world. It's maybe 500 bucks. But that can be the difference between whether someone gets cholera or dysentery, right? whether these other kinds of diseases crop up. Um, so, so I think we have to have a serious conversation about wealth, not just in terms of going to the doctor or healthcare access, but the other things and the other ways that wealth buffers one from just the realities of living in the world as a human. So that's one thing. I'll just stop at that one thing. Can talk about others. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that we haven't thought about in the United States enough some of these like basic minimum resources for a decent life. Uh, and I think we've tried very hard and lots of people have been trying to not even let that come up or as a conversation as to what is it that we all need for a basically decent minimum life. I just want to go to the priority setting because I think um, one of the things that I have found most troubling in the health justice literature and also what you know in the United States is this idea that healthcare is a limited resource, even though we spend three trillion dollars a year and more. And it's like, but it's still a limited resource. And so therefore we have to figure out how to distribute it fairly. And most recently, I think, um, you know, five years ago, a philosopher named Norman Daniel said, you know, there's no way that we're going to be able to do this in one rule. So there's lots of competing values. So let's figure out a fair procedure that we can use in order to decide how to do it. And this became sort of a checklist that people use. But it also is not only being used in America. What then happened is that that checklist and that process has been used around the world because it's you know, from an American Harvard philosopher and how to fairly distribute resources and it's been implemented. So this pandemic has made something very clear is that if someone has had an unfair life and they have gotten ill and then they come into the hospital and then the fair procedure says, sorry, you're not gonna benefit so much from this. So therefore we're gonna give it to someone else. They've gotten screwed twice. They've gotten screwed in their life outside and they're being screwed inside the hospital. That's what the riots are about. It's about the unfairness of life opportunities and then the framework of fairness in making those decisions about who lives and who dies. So priority setting for me has become, you know, if I set it on my own five years ago, people would say, oh, whatever, this is what the real situation is. 
But now here's a real moment for us to rethink what we mean by priority setting, by not just looking at, oh, in this conference room in the hospital about fairness, but thinking about fairness in society and the opportunities to live a healthy life and taking that into consideration when we think about fairness and distributing limited resources of healthcare. I have to, at this point, also make this really important observation that the National Academies of Medicine in their vaccine allocation framework have set a precedent, which is that they want people to take into consideration social vulnerability in the distribution of vaccine allocation. This means that what they're saying is that we should give some weight to the fact that people are socially disadvantaged in the way that we allocate it, whether it, people actually make that use or not. But it's the first time that people have said, oh, we should think about the life opportunities and social disadvantages and give them a bit more weight when we're distributing valuable goods and services. So I think that's a, an important thing to mark and think about. Thank you. And so now we're going to move on to some audience questions. Um, so uh, many of these questions are about sort of um, about steps m steps for the future. Um, so um, so one of the questions is um, from Winston Thompson: What should we do broadly understood? Uh, what should we broadly understood be doing now to promote healthy futures relative to the next pandemic? And Let me go first while you think this. So I'll, I'll grab this as the first opportunity. So I think there's two, uh, for me, there's two ways to answer this. One is that if you are an ethicist and philosopher, I have something to say for you. And if you're not an ethicist and philosopher, I have something to say for you. If you are a bioethicist, a political philosopher, or any kind of ethicist, this is the moment to re-examine your theories and your concepts and see if they're relevant and adequate to the issues that we are trying to deal with. The fact that the theories could not actually recognize and conceptualize social vulnerability, basic rights, uh, and all these other kinds of stuff shows that it's a weakness of the theories, not that we who found them were wrong, right? So we need to think about social justice in different ways. We need to think about bioethics in different ways. We need to think about public health ethics in different ways. We need to also think about global health ethics. America has a profound influence on the health of people on the other side of the world, and we don't give it enough attention because we're also very concerned about what's happening inside. So as philosophers, there's so much work to do, uh, and there's so much work now, and there will be now. And so this is no longer just the rarefied world of technical issues in bioethics. This is about health and social justice. If you are not a philosopher and you're just thinking about what is the right thing for me to do? I think collective action is really the most important thing that I can say right now. We have an election coming up in the United States, but more than that, don't ever think that Biden winning will solve these problems, right? Obama was president and he didn't solve all the problems. Trump is president, he didn't solve all the problems. No president and no single administration will solve the problems that only collective action can make and only communities can make. With a view towards this idea that every single person in our community has a claim to be healthy and living a good long life. I'm done, thanks. Professor Wilson, do you wanna, no? Okay, so to address the previous point about society uh, filtering out all of the disposable, uh, dispensable workers and others who, um, and others having to compensate for that. Um, what forms of compensation should we be thinking about given the um, past injustices that um, we've seen that people are still experiencing that ne negatively impact their health? So what kind of compensation forward looking um, do you think uh, is, is due? I mean, I certainly think there's a justice claim for reparations, right? I mean, I, I don't even think that, I don't think there's a hard case to be made here. And I think that there are several populations of people in the US who, for justice reasons, have claims to reparations. What form that takes, I don't have a deep, in, deep investment in, um, 
in thinking one way or another, but I, but I definitely think that that has to be on, on the table. Um, you know, brilliant economist Sandy Darity has a book that just came out over the summer, I think, um, making a case for reparations. And I think that that's, that's important work and that's going to be important foundational work. Also investment, intentional investment in infrastructure in um, communities of color, in particular Native communities. Um, there are lots of communities that don't even have kind of basic clean water or um, electricity. So infrastructure investment separate from a conversation about reparations has to be part of thinking about rectifying historic injustice and also paving the way or creating conditions so that there can be justice going forward. So those would be um, two things that I would suggest right off, right off top. So for me, um, I think in looking forward, I think we have to first and foremost uh, recognize all those workers that have allowed us to be healthy and safe at home over the last seven months. So particularly, for example, in London, and I hope that I think it's the situation for many of you, is that you've been able to have food because somebody put those food on that shelf and somebody transported that food to the grocery store. And they've had to take extra risks that you didn't have to take in order to be able to eat, whether it be the you know, people who have been making sure that the trash gets select, collected and your internet stays on and your phone stays on and your food and et cetera, all the things that have allowed us to be safe and healthy over the last seven months was made possible by certain kinds of workers. The first thing that we should do is actually acknowledge their contribution and their additional risks that they've taken and potentially make sure that they have access to the healthcare they need if they have, have gotten sick as a result of, being, of providing us with safety. Going forward, I think that we need to rethink this idea is that we think about distributing benefits, who gets what, but we haven't really given a thought about how we distribute risks in our society. So how do we, you know, who actually on a daily basis faces more risks of harm in order to be able to go and work and do the things that they need to do. And so we really need to think about workers and also them in terms of what's the risk that they are facing and try to give some sort of thought into minimizing those sort of risks. So that's, I think, you know, I'm starting very small, just acknowledgement of contribution, respect. I mean, I think this is the most important thing. If this pandemic hasn't changed the way that you think about people who work with their hands on a daily basis to make your life go well, then I don't know what else it's going to take. This is one of the most important places that we can show respect to those people around us who are working in order to help our daily lives go well. So we have probably one more question, time for one more question. Um, so this was from uh, Krista Teston. Uh, so, so much of today's fantastic conversation is encouraging us to be more attuned to external conditions for health. And I agree. Might we need to revisit definitions for and practices associated with key philosophical constructs. And she talks about dignity, but I think that one other sort of question that has come up is distribution, fair distribution, fairness, right? Um, and even justice that tend to be thought of as, so for, she's talking about dignity, tend to be thought of as inherent and located at the level of the unique, unique individual. So my question, I guess, to add on to this question, not only about dignity, um, is also just what is the, philosophical construct that you want us to think most about to change or you think that this is a good opportunity for us to like really rethink some of the um, underlying assumptions that have been made about these philosophical discussions that is ripe for reconsideration. I'll go with uh, Professor Wilson first. Okay, thank you. Um, I would say, of course, as, as a political philosopher, the philosophical concept I'm, I'm deeply interested in is, is justice. Um, I think that, it, I, I, don't know, I used to be, you know, I was trained by Kantians and so dignity mattered to me in, in particular kind of ways and it still does. Um, 
and I and I do think that there are ways that dignity is kind of inherent to the person. I think there are other ways that it's kind of socially constructed and that, that we can have these assaults on dignity and such. At the same time, as I think about, you know, just kind of living day-to-day lives and what one's life choices and chances are are shaped by i think about i think about justice right i mean if you if we are just living fun in fundamentally unjust conditions then it becomes hard to exercise these other kinds of things like dignity like self-respect like um um artistic development and educational attainment and so i think that you know the part of me that's become a little bit pessimistic over the years and that has become less inclined to think about how people think about me or changing hearts and minds, that kind of um, talk is really thinks I can wrap my my head and my hand around justice, right? Around fairness, around everything that flows from living under just conditions and the things that I, I'm sorry, I have a cuckoo clock. I hope that my earbuds were, um, uh, you know, and, and the ways that I'm able to flourish, that I can only flourish if I live in just conditions. And I think that not only has the pandemic brought that out, but the other events of this summer have brought that out. So if you make me pick one, it'll be justice. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for that. I, I, can't, I couldn't have asked for a better last question. So I want to, whoever asked this question, I want uh, you to know that there is plenty of resources. Um, so 20 years ago, uh, you know, this was something that I was interested in. And so I really have been sort of struggling and working on that same concept. But I would say that there is an area of literature called health justice, which engages theories of justice. So Rawlsian uh, theory, Dworkin and capability, Sen, Nussbaum, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, I feel bad, you know, whenever I say this, but I wrote this book called Health Justice, and it is about uh, putting health in theories of justice and the idea of thinking about health as a freedom and dignity comes at a central place because it's this idea of the dignity of the human being is reflected in their basic capabilities, right? In terms of what they're able to be and do. And this is what we mean by freedom. So I really encourage you to take a look at this book called Health Justice. But even if you don't look at that book, I really think that this idea of thinking about health as a capability, health as a freedom, and human dignity as being reflected in the basic abilities of people to live a decent life is something we should be focusing on. And, and so it seems as though we're just about to talk about all those things. And so we're about to end on that. But I, I really would like to say that it's not an uncharted territory. There's people working on it and we've been working on it. And, and I, I hope that you'll join us in thinking more about it and how we can apply that to America in the present day. Okay, well, um, virtual applause from the audience. Thank you so much, um, Professor Wilson and Professor Vinta Tapuram. It's been uh, really uh, great to talk with you today. Um, and a recording will be um, available at the Center for Ethics and Human Values uh, soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.